This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow Cook Eat Range, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven. And today I have two lovely companions. I have my husband, Adam, and a mutual friend of ours. I mean, like we both, we're both friends of the person we're interviewing. We're interviewing a painter called Francis Hamill, who is a, an old friend of ours, who I know as Frank Hamill Cook, but his painter name is Francis Hamill. And we've actually just got back from a trip to Italy where he has a house where we caught up about an exhibition of gardens that he is, is literally on this week and next week. And so I just thought it would be really lovely to get him to chat on the podcast about painting gardens, how he chose the 30 gardens that he has painted and what times of day he likes to paint, because I bet lots of you are photographers and painters and would like some inspiration from Frank, who is the most amazing painter of a kind of almost pointillist style. But Adam will tell me off because I'm rather ignorant about art. And he trained at the Ruskin and the light in Frank's paintings are the thing that is just absolutely extraordinary. You can tell exactly what time of day it is in a Turner-esque way. Anyway, incredibly welcome, Frank. Thank you. Well, it's lovely to be talking to you. So tell us a little bit about, why don't we talk about the show first and then we'll talk about your background and, and what you've done before and everything. So, so tell us, why did you decide to paint 30 gardens in, in more like something 70 or 80 paintings, maybe? Well, why garden? Why paint a garden? That's quite a lot of questions, or at least more than one. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, I think, if I... If I, well, I, I live at Rousham, which is obviously a, a, a garden that's open to the public and a garden with a, with a following. And I've lived, I've lived here for, for 25 years. And actually, I've sort of resisted painting it for the first, for the first 20-something years. And then when the pandemic started, Boris told us that we couldn't leave home. It, it didn't take me long to think that that was a sign that I should just get sort of start looking at Rousham and start start painting it. I had painted Italian gardens before a bit because William Kent, who designed the gardens at Rousham, went to Italy and spent nine years there at the beginning of the 18th century. And I sort of wanted to see at that stage whether Rousham was at all Italian, which I think actually turned out that it wasn't really. But he collected lots of, he made lots of drawings in Italy, came back, sold his ideas to grand English families. And, so, and, and there's a lot of sort of neoclassical statuary and, it, and ideas that were used in Baroque gardens at Rousham. But I was slightly scared for the first, for the first 25 years. Of, it felt as though the gardens here were, there was nothing to add to them. But in fact, once I got started, I, re, I actually couldn't really stop. And so I did a big collection of work, which came with a book a couple of years ago. And I just found myself carrying on. But once we were released from captivity, I thought, why not look at some other gardens? So this, this show is called 30 Gardens, and I've been having a fantastically lovely time painting from dawn till dusk all over England, Scotland, and Wales. Then can you say there is something different about painting a garden from painting a, a kind of non-culture or non specialized heightened landscape? What is it that a garden brings to a painting? There are several things. There, there was an interview I read years ago with a, an Italian sculptor called Giacometti who, who makes those emaciated, tall, skinny figures. I mean, very compelling, but very, very tall and thin. And he, the interviewer talks to him about or asks him why he, why he makes figures like that. And he, he describes how when he sees a figure walking down a street, he just sees the figure is a fraction of his field of vision. as a tiny stick within a vast space. And then he describes what happens when you go inside and your field of vision enlarges when you walk from a, an exterior space into an interior space. 
And I think gardens do something like that. I think your field of vision somehow expands when you go into a garden. And for, from a painter's point of view, you know, we're always looking for, for structure. We're always looking for verticals. We're, there, there are certain things that lend themselves or translate themselves more easily into a rectangle. And gardens seem to offer a, a great abundance of those things. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that's also, I mean, design-wise, gardens sort of fit that. Well, a lot of gardens fit that grid. I know it's kind of quite a trad way of designing a garden, but certainly even though this garden here is not particularly traditional, it's designed on that sort of room theme. And that isn't just a, a sort of British thing, is it? No, but there's a very interesting thing about Frank's painting that he did here, which I absolutely love, the tree that is actually just outside this window, is one of the few paintings in the show which is not architectural. It's kind of sub-architectural, isn't it? Do you know the painting I yeah. mean? Yeah, no, I do. The, of, the olive, of the olive tree surrounding yeah. it. I mean, it's interesting because that you know that I'm always looking for, for for structure. But at the stay, that you know, I came to uh, chill to paint twice, and the first time I came was on a very sort of wet couple of days in March, and then coming back when that overwhelming abundance of sort of flowers and plants is swallowing up the structure in the garden. The structure's sort of on the back foot because there's so much competition, but at the same time, there is there is a, an underlying quite strong structure in that picture. I suppose all the time, as a painter, you're you're letting the the paint speak for itself, but at the same time manipulating it. And I suppose in a garden, the same sort of relationship is happening, where you have an underlying structure, but certainly at certain times of year, the l looser, more not quite wild, but more kind of overwhelming growth that you get in the summer sort of swallows up the structure in a rather lovely way. There's a very beautiful painting here. My favourite, I think, in the entire show of one of those long, low sheds at Dixter with uh, a topiary hen, maybe, <laughs> in front of it. Peacock, I think. Is it a peacock? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's a lovely pyramid of you uh, with, yeah. with, a, with a winged bird on top. And the thing that is just kind of radiating is this wonderful roof. Mm. Really beautiful. I was grabbed by that because there's a because the roof is the roof is a clay roof and it's covered in patches of sort of white or very pale lichen. And then there's a there's one of those lovely dark cotinus shrubs in front of the peacock, which has lots of white I don't know whether they're carrots, but white flowers in front of it. There was a lovely relationship between the the white in front of the cotinus and then the white on the roof with the, with the lovely lush green peacock caught between the two. And the deep shadow inside the, the hovel, or we have a shed quite like this here, we call a hovel. And that's very important for the picture, isn't it? You have yeah. these kind of deep, dark wells in, in a garden or in a painting. Yeah, that works. I mean, it's in a very dark frame and, the, and that passage of darkness, which is the under the, under the, in the shade of the bar, it brings the dark of the frame into the picture in a rather nice way. So it looks, it looks rather good in its frame as well, that one. And it's also a very unobvious view. And I mean, you also went to Sissinghurst, of course, and that you have done a, a, a painting of the um, Rosa Mulligani and looking towards the tower in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of more classical way. But uh, there is also a very beautiful more unusual and kind of quite side viewy in a way painting of the priest house which is the building at the northern end of Sissinghurst and that that I think is is again sort of less structured and and really magical and atmospheric so how, how do you how do you decide Frank when you arrive in a garden you know to talk us through the process of deciding what to paint and then when you know really making decision to put a, a a brush to your canvas. Well, the a lot of the gardens in this collection were gardens that I I didn't know, so I hadn't been to Sissinghurst before. I hadn't been to Birch Hill before this year either, and so I suppose it reminds me slightly of those photographs that actors put in 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 the, in the catalogues or or maybe dating sites where you arrive at a garden and the pictures you've seen are of a much younger, more handsome garden than the one that. <laughs> And it's and it's sometimes the case that you know you arrive on a drizzly day and it's not looking great. But but I you know obviously I I have I have ideas about what I'm going to do when I arrive. But in practice, you're usually hijacked on your way to 
the preordained site by something that that grabs you. And I suppose the first thing you have to do is sort of listen to the garden. You know, I mean, obviously I can kind of muscle in and superimpose my ideas about landscape painting onto it, but I have to restrain myself. The other, I suppose the other key thing which you alluded to before is that the beginning and the end of the day are kind of key times. And at somewhere like Sissinghurst or a Great Dixter with a lot of visitors, I was there in June when I could get sort of six hours worth of work done before anybody arrived. So it's a practical thing, but also the light, you know, you know as, as well as anybody, the light, that, that low theatrical light you get at the beginning and the end of the day is, is very seductive. And you can almost always find something looking wonderful if you, if you light it from that angle. So I suppose it's important to be receptive, and it's usually quite important to get up quite early and stay, and stay late on into the day. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, I mean, I know when you were here, I mean, you know, you, it looks almost like a finished painting, but I know it isn't. So then you take it back to the studio. And, and can you just talk us through that process as well? So you spend sort of a few hours or a day or whatever, in a way, doing a, a sketch, but in, in color and with oil. And then, and then explain what happens after that. Well, there's a certain amount of wastage. So I, I, it's a, like a sort of fishing trip. You, know, you, you kind of work like mad uh, outside. And then I get back to the studio, I sort of see what I've got. And some pictures you know, don't make the grade. And other pictures become larger pictures. So the studies, the one that Adam was talking about, of so that bar at Great Dixter, I think will become a big picture. I haven't made a big picture from it this time around. But some of the ones at Great Dixter, the studies, once I get them inside, I can see whether they'll translate into bigger pieces and I can't work on big paintings outside so they all start as little paintings and they all start outside and then once they're in the studio the paintings start to sort of talk to each other and so I get them in there and I carry on working perhaps on a dozen at the same time over weeks and weeks and weeks in in a rather unscientific way really they just kind of call out to you and you and you kind of go over and pick the same thing as in the gardens you I, I go to the studio in the morning thinking I'm going to be working on one picture and when I go and I see something I think oh god I better Better work on that one. Yeah. Okay. And and how did you decide on the gardens? I mean, there's one allotment I know, and there's a vegetable garden in Devon. But um, how did you? I mean, I know a lot of them are very famous, but just talk about that a bit. Well, the allotments are. I painted them years ago, and I love painting allotments. So there are two sites in Oxford which I've. I mean, it's harder to get into an allotment than it is to get into a lot of. <laughs> They're quite well fortified, but the but the relationship between the structure and the plant, you know, the the, the structural planting and the and the looser planting and all the little sheds and so on. I mean, they're very like, you know, the the, the sort of neoclassical follies that Rousham and Stourhead speak quite comfortably with the corrugated iron sheds on the trap ground a lot. It's in Oxford. Seasonally, I started off in winter with gardens that had a lot of structure in. So I started at. Levens, which is that wonderful topiary garden up in Cumbria. Bod- Bodlan, which is in North Wales, which is another incredibly cleverly structured garden. Amazing plants in it too. Um, Eiford Manor and Stourhead. I mean, th- those gardens look good at any time of year. They're not really yeah. reliant on, on, on planting. So it was very obvious to start in those places in the frost and rain. And then gradually, and the other thing I suppose is that, is that when, I, when I was at Great Dick's Drive, I was told about a wonderful little garden near there called Balmoral Cottage Garden, a private garden. And so when the crowds got too, too much at Dixter, I, I could just drive five miles over there and, and work there. And everyone has a, a, a garden nearby that they want to recommend. So it was sort of self-perpetuating once I got started. I mean, there's a, obviously it's, you can carry on forever with this one. Yeah. Yeah. Did this kind of huge exposure to gardens, did it change change your ideas of what, what you loved about a garden or what you thought a garden needed? It's quite hard not to be judgmental about So, I mean, I suppose it's a tricky one because, I mean, Sissinghouse is very strikingly a garden of taste in, in as much as the colour arrangements there are very cleverly conceived and brilliantly implemented so to have a garden where you know there's a garden with just white in it and then another garden with yellows and reds and oranges in it and then the the, the, the deep pinks and the blues are kept together i mean that 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 i haven't seen a garden where it was as cleverly conceived and as well thought out as that before and after great dixter it was quite a shock because great dixter is a, is a miraculous work of genius as a garden and there are loads of things I like about it. But the colour schemes I found fairly hair-raising in some places. And one of the lessons, you know, if you're teaching, teaching painting, 
one of the things you have to get people to do is to limit their range. So, you know, you can't paint with all the tones from black to white and all the colours in the paintbox. And it feels as though, you know, it's easier to start with a string quartet and end up with an orchestra. And, and True. you know, it's a great fixture is a, you know, every musical instrument ever conceived with, uh, with, with bright sunlight on it. And so I, I suppose it doesn't, it, it, it affects the way I paint things. I pretty... I mean, I'm, flowers and plants are not what I know about. And I suppose a lot of people take, and in overhearing conversations around the gardens that I've been in, people, people are obviously, a lot of the time, are talking about what's planted and how it's doing and what they've got in their gardens. And they have these very personal issues. And it's interesting to look at the gardens as a painter. I suppose there's a lot of stuff I'm actually not interested in and leaving out. And ultimately, it's structure that, that draws me in. Very good. And so tell us a, a bit, about the show, so it, it's on. Uh, give us the dates, Frank, so that everybody can. It's um. So it's it's Francis Hamill Thirty Gardens is what it's called, and it's at the John Martin Gallery, which is in Albemarle Street, uh, just off Piccadilly, and it's from the twelfth to the twenty seventh of October. So starting pretty soon. And if you can't physically get there, you can look at them on 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 the website, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are a lot of the pictures have just arrived on my Instagram as it happens. But the uh, gallery have a fantastic website with all the pictures you can download the catalogue. I mean, it's better to see them in the flesh because they're objects. You know, they radiate something a bit extra. But yeah, they look fine in photos as well. So all all those details we'll put in the podcast notes, everybody, so you don't have to write them down. And um, yeah, anything else, Frank, that that you want to chat about? He wants to say how much he loved coming to Perch Hill. <laughs> and it was just the most exciting, revelatory experience. You know how much I loved coming to <laughs> yeah. Perch Hill, Adam. Um, I couldn't keep a smile off my face. I was looking at an exhibition at the National Gallery of Paul Arrego called Crivelli's Garden. And I haven't been to see it, but uh, it's based on a mural that Paul Arrego did at the National Gallery and a painting by someone called Carlo Crivelli, who was a local painter in Le Marque where we last saw each other. Mm. And the, uh, the, ba- the painting it's based on is called Ma- The Madonna delle Rondine, uh, which was the, the, it, the really good wine around us. It's made in a town called Metallica at this painting. I don't know how it made the journey from, the na- from, from Metallica to the National Gallery, but Rondine is swallowed and there's a swallow in the painting. And um, uh, I thought that would be an interesting thing for you to look at because I know birds are attracting your attention at the moment. And there was a very nice link between the swallow, Carlo Crivelli, Le Marque, and our last conversation about birds. We could be talking about food, couldn't we, Sarah, as well, because that's a, another another connection. But that's that's a different podcast. Frank has contributed <laughs> several recipes to my cookbooks in the past. So thank you, Frank. It's lovely to chat, and I really recommend going to look at his paintings, ideally in the flesh, but if not, check them out, because if you are into gardens, which you must be, otherwise you wouldn't be listening to this podcast, I know you will be interested and love them. They're pure seduction, these paintings. They usher you in and in. Very kind words, and lovely to talk to you both. Thanks for listening to the podcast again. Next week, I'm joined by Gary Newell, who's our senior horticultural buyer, and he knows lots and lots about perennials and climbers and shrubs. Next week, I'm chatting to him about the 12 best climbers. See you then. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.